Let's hear from the coach. This is Behind the Beard with Bobby Smirniotis, Forge FC head coach and sporting director. Now, the woman who takes us there, here's Mackenzie Barwell on the Forge Audio Network. I think this is week eight now of Behind the Beard, joined by head coach and sporting director, Coach Bobby. We're on camera. How does it feel? It's normal, I guess. <laughs> Camera's always rolling during the Camera's game. always I, on. I think I'm somewhere around there on the pitch. Did you, So you didn't know that we were going to be filming this today, but still you have such a great setup in your office. Like It's like you planned it almost. Yeah, usually we get the white screen uh, behind my <laughs> desk over there, so this is what's happening on the other side of the room. <laughs> Everybody gets the inside scoop now. It's not a green screen. This is for real. And you said that you, you just moved a ball that you had since 2019 – is there a story behind that? You said your kids won't let you take it out of your office. Yeah, I came in here, I think, in preseason of uh, 2019 uh, when my two boys were a little bit younger. Okay. That kept them busy playing in the office, and they <laughs> they haven't let me uh, get rid of it uh, since then. Okay. It's falling apart at, uh, at each seam, but it's uh, still here. It's not the cutest. No, definitely not. So for now, we'll leave it out of the screen. It's but, theirs. But it's just there that so we know yeah. in spirit. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to start by asking you about Garvin because he was back at training this morning. I had a conversation with him after practice, obviously coming back from the Gold Cup, playing with the Haitian national team. What can you say about Garvin and what he contributes to the team both on and off the pitch? First and foremost, he's an excellent professional. Just from day one when he's come in here, his work ethic, his attention to detail and, and how he takes care of himself, uh, not only on the field, but off the field is uh, is exceptional. That's what allows him to grow as a player and uh, I'm extremely proud. You know, I watched all three of his games at the at the Gold Cup with uh, with Haiti and he's out there playing in, with some of the best uh, competition in, the, in teams like Mexico and he's done an excellent job and uh, we can only be proud of him as uh, members of Forge FC. Yeah, he seemed thrilled when I talked to him after practice today. What can you say about just representing um, a team at the national level? What do you think that experience will do for him as a player? Yeah, I think it's massive. You know, when I when I look at the uh, club football, I will say you know the biggest prestige and thing you look forward to is is playing on continental uh, on the continental stage. And mm -hmm. a lot of the players in this room have had that ability um, to do it with our club. You know, beyond that, uh, I think every player wants to be able to play in a major competition. World Cup, Gold Cup, mm -hmm. uh, European Championship, you know, every continent has their competition. So when you're able to do that, you know, you're at the top end of football. Um, so I think that's great for a player. That's, I think that's great for a player like Garvin, who's gone there, played three almost full matches, uh, been very important for the squad. And we look forward to him bringing that momentum into, into this next part of the season for us. Yeah, well, he, alongside a, a few other CPL players, had the opportunity to play in the Gold Cup. We just saw some stats that they posted on their website, actually. I'll have to double check them now because I don't want to give you any false information. But... So 75% of the available minutes in 2022 were Canadians. Nine current and former players from the CPL were brought up to the national team. We've talked about this before, but now that we have this evidence of how influential the CPL can be on an international level, what is what are your reaction to those numbers? Uh, it's normal and they're yeah. only going to grow. Yeah. Uh, I think it's simple. You know, once you have a domestic league like everywhere else in the world, uh, most of uh, your top end players will, will come from there. You know, for us, we're a new league. Uh, we're into our fifth year. It's going to take some time. Mm -hmm. We've had some success, but I think not only will that exponentially grow, but it will become the norm. Is that going to be in the next five years or 10 years? I don't know exactly what the time frame is, but it'll be normal that players, not only on the Canadian national team, but for other national teams with all the backgrounds that we have of players mm -hmm. um, in Canada, that there'll be a lot of them playing for their uh, not for different national teams around the world. Yeah. You guys spend so much time together, and that's why I mentioned Garvin having to step back a little bit. Um, for the Gold Cup, you train every morning, you have lunch together after. What do you think those moments after training do for, for you as a team? I think they're some of the most important moments, what you do before training and what's going on after training. You know, on the pitch, the guys are out there to work. You know, it could be an hour and 15 minutes, an hour 30 minutes, an hour 40 minutes, depending on, on the day. Um, you know, but before that, uh, they're together for another hour and a half. After training, they're still here for another hour and a half to two hours. It's that time where they're able to bond, discuss, discuss the game, mm -hmm. discuss training, our games, or even 
other issues uh, that are going on in our world. And I think that gives them a better perspective on who they all are. Yeah. Uh, and when you're able to bond and come together like that, it makes uh, coming together and bonding on the field much easier as a team. Yeah, I've seen it too, because you talk about how, you know, the conversation at lunch is not necessarily about the game. When I first came to meet everybody, it was at lunch, and I was a lot more intimidated watching practice than when I walked into a room full of guys just eating lunch. I was like, these they're just normal, right? Normal. That's 100% for sure. Sometimes it's that thing we, we look at the professional athletes, and, and we see them in their zone, and, and, yeah. and the competitive spirit, the... Uh, uh, but off of that, uh, you look at a guy like Manjikar James, and uh, he's a ruthless uh, defender. <laughs> um, but he's the first one with the biggest smile and the most yes, jokes off the pitch. Yes, it's so true. A friendly giant, you might yes. say. Okay, I want to get your opinion on this because I ran into some guys in the elevator on their way up to lunch. They said, you know, there's a rotation of a couple meals, like a, b a good amount, I think. Can you please give us your opinion on what the best one is? Because we had tacos today at the staff lunch, and let me tell you, Corey's nodding his head. It was good. Well, I think we would have liked tacos today at, uh, at lunch. Uh, that, that came through our rotation, I think it was about two weeks ago, to our surprise. Ah, so you got to wait another two I weeks I think that uh, we saw a lot of smiles uh, on that day. Um, yeah, they do a great job of, uh, of, of variety. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot more international flavor uh, yeah. this year. Yes, um, You know, yes. we've got the, the lunches with the Caribbean theme, with the uh, East Indian, Greek, Italian. Um, so they're doing a great job up at the kitchen. They're of, hitting of all the stops. Yes. They're hitting all the yes. stops. Okay, sorry, I got off track there. We'll go back. But we talked a lot about how there are different personalities, like you say, on the team. And sometimes you have to adapt in terms of your coaching style. How do you balance meeting those needs individually, but also achieving your goals for the team on a more general and broad level? I think the biggest thing is you, you need to understand what globally the players can take in as information as a group right and okay. when you're talking in, in that sense and, and who it's reaching and sometimes who you need to be a little bit more individual with yes sometimes that may come from myself but sometimes that comes from the assistants as well mm -hmm. um for sometimes uh, the young players you know we have more of a role with our with our assistants and and coach kit and uh, and eddie um to be closer with them sometimes uh, there is an intimidating factor with the coach um but, uh, you know, you just got to look at each and every player uh, individually. You can't lump them uh, all together. I think that's one of the most important things in coaching and, and know how you can affect the player. Um, some t players uh, can take instant uh, criticism very well. Yeah. Some need to take it in an individual um, scenario. So it's important to understand y your players. And to understand your players, you need to know more about them than just on the field. Uh, you need to know where they come from off the field, what their what their backgrounds are like, and all those different things, so that you're able to have those different conversations, and then blend in the football when it's yeah, needed. Yeah, yeah. Well, even before we filmed this interview, I interrupted meetings that you're having with the players. Are, are those meetings something that you have on a normal basis to check in? Yeah, individually, certain players, uh, and it's doesn't necessarily a lot of times in coaching we think oh you got to meet with players when things aren't going well right. uh no sometimes it's just to to catch up and see how how things are going or maybe get their thoughts on on training or or a previous match mm -hmm. um and sometimes it is uh, that there's uh, certain issues that maybe need to be resolved and so on. So you just need to find that right balance uh, of doing it, but also not being overbearing as a coach and wanting yeah. to do it uh, every week with every player. <laughs> do you find that in terms of the reactions to results, are the reactions universal? Or do you find when you come into the locker room after a loss, after a win, people process differently? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when you win, uh, most people are happy. Mm -hmm. um, we have an interesting group. Sometimes uh, we win games and it doesn't look like we've uh, we've won a game. It's, yeah. uh, it's kind of that uh, uh, it's, it's something that we're supposed to do. And it's something we also try and, uh, you know, re-energize the players about, about sometimes enjoying wins a little bit more. Yes. And it's a strange thing to talk well, about, uh, especially here at Forge. You know, the players have, uh, you know, a lot of pressure and that they're demanded to win. And it's, it's not so much demanded to win from the public or from the fans, but their own demands on themselves, mm -hmm. uh, on the standards uh, that they've set. And of course, when you when you lose games or when you're in a situation right now where we haven't been our best in the last few games, there's, there's always going to be disappointment uh, at the end of the game. Uh, the one great thing this team has the ability to do is, is flip the switch in the next day in training and, and get back to, to working. Um, because whether things are going well or not, um, that's the only road to success. Yeah. How do you measure success? Aside from results, are there some things that you 
would identify in a performance where you can sit confidently say, okay, we did that right. That can count as a positive going into our next matchup. Yeah, most importantly is growth. And are you doing the right things? You know, that's what will bring success, whether it's today, tomorrow, or, or next week. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not doing the right things and you're getting the wins, the one thing I can say as a coach, it's usually going to come back and, and reverse its, uh, itself and you're going to yeah. go the other way. Um, so the most important thing for us is our process and, and how we do things, uh, our performances and, and, you know, what we're getting out of that and are the players growing? Because then I know in the long term, success comes. You know, that's the one thing I've, uh, I've always preached with the players and I, I truly believe in. Um, because, you know, what we're, we're doing today uh, and we could be great, uh, we can't let it get too ahead of us because it may not be the reflection of who we are in two weeks. And in our down days, you know, that's also not the reflection of, uh, of who we will be in, in two weeks. So we just got to keep an, uh, a steady, uh, steady mentality about how we look at things. And the performance is, is important. And the one great thing you, you know with players is they know when they've performed well. Yeah. And they know when the, the standard is not there and, and how we get out of that situation. Well, it's interesting for you too because you've been here since 2019. Do you think that since you've had this prolonged experience coaching with this team, these smaller stints where you don't feel like maybe you're playing to the level that you want to be are almost easier or more tolerable because you know, you know the potential of these players? Yeah, so one thing we always talk about, it's uh, we know what talent is in our in our room on the good days and the bad days and uh, that uh, you understand how, how to work with the players and you have the belief in the players. Like you said, you know, we've been doing this since uh, since 2019 um, with a lot of success, but also in, the, in each and every year always had a different challenge um, for, for the group. Uh, and it's about how you come out of those challenges. That's that's the most important thing. And I think that's when you look at success because it's easy to measure success with, with wins. Uh, but in a league, uh, that's like the CPL and most North American leagues that have uh, you know various things like salary caps and roster caps where every team is on the even page. You know, we can't just go out into the transfer market and ask Bob Young to, uh, to splurge money tomorrow. <laughs> um, so we're all working on the same way. And, and, yeah, and those yeah. are the toughest leagues to win. Um, so we've been successful and we'll continue to be successful. Um, but we can't just measure success with making sure that there's a North Star Shield in the, in the locker room. You know, that's a byproduct of us doing everything well um, throughout the season. If you do that, you give yourself a good chance of competing for that. And that's what we want to be able to do again this year. Okay, Bobby, I think we'll wrap on that. Before we finish, though, I was talking to um, some of the players earlier this morning. July 15th is our Forging the Future match, and we're looking for kids, enthusiastic ones, to help with in-game hosting, public announcing, and refereeing. What are the odds your kids would be in... <laughs> would potentially want to be involved in this because I was like, what if I had Coach Bobby Smirnionis' children in-game hosting on July 15th? May not be a bad idea. Okay. These guys, okay. Uh, these guys know everything thoroughly about this team and about <laughs> performances and what's going on at Tim Hortons Field. Yeah. They haven't missed, uh, I don't think, more than a handful of games in exactly. five years here. Maybe throw them in with the referees. Your fourth official can be your, your son. There you go. Actually, that might be problematic. Yes. That may, <laughs> that may be a little bit of a conflict of interest, but... I'm sure you'll find a different role for them. <laughs> All right, Bobby. Thank you so much again. I appreciate it. Thank you. This has been Behind the Beard with Mackenzie Barwell and Bobby Smyrniotis. If you like what you heard, please like, follow, subscribe, comment, and share.